Hello and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast and I am your host, Samuel. In this podcast, I interview top medical sales reps and leading medical sales executives across the entire country. And it doesn't matter what medical sales industry, from medical device to pharmaceutical to genetic testing to diagnostic lab, you name it, you will learn how to either break into the industry, be a top 5% performer within your role in sales, or climb the corporate ladder. Welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. All right. Hello, Rachel. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you so much for being on the show with us today. So Rachel is actually with a leading medical device sales company. She is in the CMF division in Mableton, Georgia. Rachel, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Um, So I am the um, CMF regional manager for a large medical device company. I've been in this position for a little over a year. Um, I cover the Southeast, um, encompassing uh, Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, parts of Tennessee and parts of Georgia. And, um, you know, I manage a team of about about 30 consultants who, you know, cover cover that area. Um, And it's focused on, you know, facial reconstruction, orthognathics, um, neuro, uh, rib plating, sternal closure, and uh, general facial trauma. Wow. That's pretty, um, yeah, actually tell us, is that, is that more of an elective or is that a mix? What type of surgeries are those? So I would say it's a solid mix. Um, you know, so from a, from a neuro standpoint with the neurosurgeons, um, some of those procedures are due to, you know, due to aneurysms, head trauma, um, things of that nature where, you know, they have to access the brain. We sell the, the plates and screws that will help close the flap. Um, we also make custom implants, um, which may be a little bit more of, a, of a, an elective procedure um, if a patient has a, has a head trauma and um, they're not able to, you know, to save the bone. Um, we do make custom, custom flaps to, to tie into that, which would be a little bit more cosmetic. Um, from a facial standpoint, um, it's a solid mix of, of trauma, like where you get uh, motor vehicle accidents, um, people getting into fights, um, anything where you would have fractures in the, in the facial arena. Um, mm-hmm. but it can also be elective. So from that perspective, um, people can come in for cosmetic reasons. Maybe they don't like how they look. Um, and we have a great product line of 3d printed implants and 3d printed plates, um, where the surgeon can design, um, an actual implant to, to help achieve the look that the patient is going for. So from that perspective, it, it can be elective as well. Um, and as I mentioned, we also do, um, you know, rib plating and sternal closure. So um, that is generally trauma or like an open heart surgery type of procedure. So um, again, it, it can come from car accidents, high, you know, high velocity um, injuries um, where you see multiple rib fractures, the surgeon will go in and, and fix those. Okay. Wow. That's pretty invasive stuff. So then let me ask you this. So when it comes to your interaction with the surgeon and the patients, do you have a lot of, do you meet your patients at all? Or do you have absolutely no patient interaction outside of the procedure? Um, yeah, we, we don't meet the patients at all, um, you know, due to HIPAA and, and things of that nature. You know, we're, we're providing support to the surgeons and the, the OR staff. So, um, you know, we will go in with the surgeon um, on planning sessions for the 3D printed implants that I mentioned. Um, you know, we'll be on, it's a virtual call where we, we get on with an engineer, a surgeon, and then, you know, like I said, the rep will be there just to make sure we have a solid understanding of what the surgeon is trying to accomplish. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. And then when they actually go into the operating room, um, generally, you know, we're only in there when the patient's asleep. So, okay. um, you know, no, no patient interaction. And how long are the typical procedures? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it, it depends on what you're doing. Um, I mean, they can range anywhere from a couple hours to, I've seen some go like 16 hours when we 16 were doing hours. 16 hours. Wow. Um, and some of those are, it's a procedure, what we call a, um, a a mandible resection. Mm -hmm. It's actually where they, they cut out, you know, sometimes the entire mandible, sometimes half the face Mm -hmm. or half of the jawline, I'm sorry. Um, and they actually transplant, um, the living fibula and the blood vessels that are attached to the fibula into the, into the chin. Um, those take, like I said, 12, 15 hours. I can only imagine. So when you're, when you're in the operating room, going through this 16 hour procedure, I mean, just paint a little picture of what that's actually like. 
Well, as a rep, I mean, you're not necessarily in there the entire time. Okay. So, you know, you, you want to be there when, when they're getting started, make sure they have all the equipment set up, make sure their, their sets are, are sterile. There's no holes in the packages that would, you know, cause a delay in the procedure. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get there first thing in the morning, make sure you speak to the surgeons, make sure you're all on the same page as far as what they're trying to accomplish as far as equipment and their needs are from that perspective. Um, a lot of times those, you know, a big part of that surgery is the actual resection um, where the surgeon's, you know, looking through a microscope to, to identify microvascular structures. While they're doing that, I mean, they're extremely focused. Um, they don't want distractions in the room. So a lot of times we'll step out um, mm-hmm. for a couple hours and just kind of check in um, with the circulating nurse to make sure, you know, to kind of know when you're needed. Um, and then you want to be there when they're putting in the implants to make sure that everything goes smoothly with that. So again, it's communicating with the, with the OR staff and, um, you know, making sure that you're there, you know, as, as much as possible, um, but also not getting in the way. So it's a delicate balance, um, because like I said, the surgeon's incredibly focused on, on what they're trying to do, obviously. Right. Um, so right. you don't right. want to be, you don't want to be a distraction or anything like that. You want to make sure that you're only there when they actually need you there. Gotcha. Uh, Okay, so let's, let's take it back a little bit. Now that you've painted the picture of what you do, we want to know how you got into the industry, uh, where you're coming from. You graduated from Georgia Institute of Technology. In college, did you know you wanted to get into medical device sales? No, I, I honestly, I didn't even know it existed. <laughs> uh, so I, I um, went to school um, wanting to become a doctor and okay. um, realized about halfway through that I did not want to go to medical school. Um, so I have a pre-med biology degree and, um, you know, so my senior year of college, I actually, I got an internship at the CDC um, working at a lab there okay. and, and doing research, um, which I actually really enjoy. Um, but it didn't pay anything because it was an internship. <laughs> so um, that springboarded me into getting, a, I, I took a research, research associate position with a small biotech company in Atlanta, um, right out of school. Um, worked for them for about a year. Um, it was incredibly boring. Um, and we had sales reps that would come in to, to sell us our, our chemicals, our lab equipment, um, you know, the, the pipettes, yeah. you know, yeah. centrifuges, test tubes. Sure. Um, and so I would talk to them and I would, and I would say to them, I was like, Hey, like, how do I, how do I get a job like that? Right. Where, right. Right. where I'm okay. not using the pipettes, <laughs> I'm selling them to somebody else and, and speaking to people all day. Um, so they, they actually put me in touch with a recruiter who, okay. um, you know, basically, you know, I was only a year out of college and, um, their message to me was I, I needed some business experience and some sales experience. So um, that particular recruiter helped me find a job um, with Toshiba Business Solutions. I sold copiers for them. And basically she told me, she was like, look, if you can be successful at this, you will open the door for whatever type of medical sales, scientific sales. I I was looking for scientific sales is what I told her. I I would have done biotech, pharma. I didn't know, like I said, I didn't even know medical sales was a thing. that where you can go in the operating room. I, I had no idea. So um, she gave me that really great suggestion, got me got me a job or put me in front of the right people to get the job. I, I earned the job. I had to interview, okay. obviously. Okay. Um, and from there, I, you know, I just put my nose to the grindstone and um, got out and I was the lead rep every month that I was there. Wow. Um, I, wow. I got re- rookie of the year. Um, I earned the president's trip that year. And as soon as I got those awards, I put my resume back out and said, this is not where I want to be. Wow. Um, these awards are great and yeah. you know, yeah. income's yeah. great, yeah. but um, I don't want to do this. So um, at that point, I started interviewing with pharmaceutical companies mm-hmm. and actually had like two or three offers from there. Um, okay. And I had just about accepted one and um, got an interview to be an associate with a medical device company. Um, and it was in orthopedic trauma. And um, once I made it through the first couple interviews and learned more about it, I realized very quickly that that was what I wanted to do. Um, I thought it was an incredible mix of being in the operating room and also, you know, getting to use my my scientific background because mm-hmm. um, I, I am a science nerd <laughs> when it comes down to it. Um, and so, you know, I thought it was a great, uh, a great mix for me, um, seeing as how I did want to become a doctor at one point in my life. 
Um, so I started out as an associate. It was actually, it was an incredible pay cut for me. It was about a 50% pay cut from selling copiers. Wow. 50% um, pay cut. Okay. Yep. It was a big pay cut. And, you know, like I said, for me, it was more important to, to see the opportunity and what I could become with a medical sales career, as opposed mm -hmm. to what I was currently doing and not excited about. So I took the, you know, I took the pay cut and, um, took an associate role and worked in downtown Atlanta as a trauma rep. I had three um, senior consultants that I worked for. We covered the whole city, um, which had two level one trauma centers and um, an academic medical, two academic medical centers as well. And, and then the surrounding community hospitals. And just to give you an idea of how much it's grown and how the industry has changed a bit, you know, that was in 2005. And there were, like I said, the three senior reps and me, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. now there's a team of like 12 or 15 covering that same. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so it, it was a um, challenging lifestyle. I, I worked insane hours, um, but within six months, there was, um, there was a position that came up in, in Athens, Georgia. And so I applied for that as a, as a senior consultant. Okay. And um, I earned that position. I was, I was given the opportunity to, to take over that territory. So. Excellent. Excellent. Um, that was a good lifestyle change for me. I, I believe it. So before we go any <laughs> further, I mean, gosh, you, 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 it seems like you had so much growth in a relatively uh, quick amount of time. Um, I want to go back to, where you were advised to take a, to get some sales experience before going in and, and attempting to get a medical sales position. So now in, in 2020, how do you view that? Do you believe that you can come from a different industry and, and, and get directly into an associate sales position within medical device sales specifically? I think for the, for the right person, yes. Um, you know, I think what I'm looking for when I'm interviewing candidates is more the attitude and the ambition than their actual knowledge of product or, you know, the, the procedures that they're going to be covering. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in my case, you know, I had a, I had a pre-med degree. So for me, it was an easy transition to, to learn the products and to learn the procedures. But I think the sales, the sales experience was extremely important um, to learn, you know, the sales cycle, to learn how to hear no over and over and over again, um, and to be escorted out of buildings by security, <laughs> to have my card ripped up and thrown in my face, um, oh, yes. you know, and, and to, to build that, that resilience and the tenacity to, to keep going after, you know, multiple failures. So I think that, you know, it was the best advice I could have gotten. Um, honestly, <laughs> I learned so much and, and I, and I, and I took it as that opportunity. I saw sure. it as, you know, this is a stepping stone to get to where I want to be. It's not my end game. So, um, I was never complacent in it and knew that I was motivated to, to get somewhere else with it. So I think that's it's excellent. important um, to be able okay. to prepare. Okay. No, that's excellent. That's, that's key. Um, and then you also mentioned something about, I mean, this goes right in line with what you're saying now that you look for the ambition and the attitude. You took a pay cut uh, and a 50, that's a significant pay cut. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what made you so certain you wanted to be in medical device sales and, and, and why did that pay cut almost seem, you know, like a, like a non-issue? So I, I would attribute it to a couple things. So, you know, first of all, I was, I was young. I didn't have a family to support or anything like that. So I had the ability to do that, which obviously will impact anybody's decision. You have to look at your personal situation. Um, but for me, the driving factor was the opportunity. Um, I, you know, when I was interviewing um, and, and learned about what the potential was in the position, that spoke volumes to me. And, and even though when I'm signing on to an associate role in my position at the time, I was told it was a two-year program and that I would be doing that for two years. I, you know, was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to apply for a senior position um, much sooner than that, but that was just because somebody, you know, somebody left. That doesn't always happen. Um, so, you know, for me, it was looking at the big picture and saying, okay, you know, what's my five-year goal? You know, do I, do I want to be selling copiers for the next five years and, and making twice as much as I am now, but maybe, you know, stagnating at a, at a certain point, or do I want to be able to say that I'm, you know, I'm able to, to quadruple that or, you know, go much farther than that and have a career that's more rewarding and, and interesting to me.
Um, so I started as an associate um, working under three senior reps with the understanding that um, it was a two-year position and I was trying to earn, earn my place on the team um, within their territory. And so, you know, the idea being that I helped them grow enough that there would be room for a fourth person on the team in two years. But um, about six months into it, there was a position that opened up in Athens, Georgia, which is it's about an hour outside of Atlanta. Um, college town, it's where, where UGA is. And um, I applied for that position and interviewed for that and, and earned that spot. So I was able to um, kind of graduate, so to speak, into a senior role um, nice. about six, seven months after I started. Nice. So, so would you say that it's a good idea for someone that's making the case for why they should be on a team that wants to enter medical device sales, that they have to look at their new role that they're taking on as if they're taking something they're taking money away from the reps that are currently there so they better yes. bring they better they better come <laughs> in as an asset and deliver and provide value so those reps are saying this person is taking money out of my paycheck but i'm happy for it because they're making my job even easier is that is that a sensible way to to look to go about it absolutely i mean when i'm when i'm hiring associate um associate positions i am um typically I, what i say to them i'm like look you need to look at this as like a two-year two-year interview um, you're, you're trying out for the team, wow. um, you know, because at this point, you know, if we hire you, yes, you're taking the, the pay that they're paying you is directly coming out of their paychecks. So you need to bring value and you need to help them drive growth because if you don't drive growth, there's not going to be a place for you in two years. Sure. So, um, you know, it's a matter of, you know, looking at the opportunity ahead of you and saying, you know, do I, I see potential for this territory to, to turn into something much bigger than it already is. Um, and there's obviously different, um, different scenarios. Um, it's just that in the position that I'm, I'm in right now um, with CMF, we are, you know, we're in an incredible growth phase. So, so I'm hiring mainly in my position, I'm mainly hiring associates um, looking for them to grow the territory enough to earn their spot on the team. Wow. Got it. Okay. So then going back to you just now you are a sales rep or a sales consultant. You, it's your, it's your world now. Tell us what happened next in your career and, and how you eventually got into leadership. So um, when I first started in Athens, um, I, I think it's actually kind of an interesting story because sure. my, um, my number one customer, he was our number one user in, in Athens. And I walked into a territory we were doing about 800,000 in sales um, and he was using, like I said, he was our number one customer, but he didn't use this for everything. He was a big traumatologist in town and, um, he just kind of used one of our niche products, but he did a lot of it. And so I started going to his cases and he would say to me, he's like, I hate reps. I don't want reps in my room. I don't need you here. What Oops. are you doing? And, um, <laughs> so wow. I, um, I just said, well, you know, I am relatively new. I'm, come, I'm new to this territory and I just would like to learn how you do things because everyone knows that you're, you're the best in the area. So if you don't mind, can I just observe your cases and I promise I'll keep my mouth shut and I won't say a word. And he was like, I really don't care what you do and walked away. Um, so. So, so wait, wait, let me stop you there. So, you know, our surgeons depending on you for, the, for a lot of these devices, why did he have that attitude and, and, and how was he able to operate that way, not needing the reps at all? So um, at that, at, at those facilities, part of the reason that position came open was because the rep prior to me did not come to cases. Like he didn't, he didn't service. Um, so people who were using us there were truly using us because they thought that they were the best products. It wasn't because of the rep. It wasn't because of relationships. They were just using what they thought was best. Sure. And um, so they weren't used to having a rep service them. Um, obviously the industry has changed dramatically in the yeah. last 15 years. So yeah. well, that was 14 years ago, but um yeah. But, you know, it's, it's changed a lot. There's a lot more competition. Um, you know, I would say that surgeons now have come to depend on reps a lot more just because, mm -hmm. you know, hospital staff, like they're not, um, they're not having the same. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to get in today. <laughs> 
um, the hospital staff isn't necessarily, you know, trained on the products and the products have become more technical as well, the instrumentation and the, um, the pr actual procedures. So the equipment's a little bit more difficult to, to assemble than it was, you know, 15 years ago because technology sure. advances. So, you know, I would say now that you're not going to find that very often where surgeons are using products and reps aren't servicing them like that. Right. That would be a rare scenario. Yeah. Um, but what I do, but it, what I did take away from that is, you know, like I said, I, I continued to come to his cases, even though he completely ignored me, um, wouldn't give me the time of day, um, basically told me to, to, you know, buzz off. And, um, I kept showing up every day. <laughs> um, and, and one day I would say it probably took about two months of me showing up in his operating room every day. Um, and the nurses were starting to like me. They were starting to be friendly with me. I was building those relationships. And I also obviously had other surgeons at the account that were using me here and there as well. Um, so I just used every opportunity that I could to, to try to build relationships within the, within the facility. And um, one day I was standing in the operating room with him and I'll, I'll never forget it because he just was like, so Rachel, he's like, tell us about yourself. And I'm like, what do you, what do you want to know? <laughs> and so he just started asking me all these questions about my, I mean, like, how old am I? Where am I from? What do I do? Like, you know, and it turned out his daughter was the same age as me. And um, so he ended up connecting us um, uh, because I didn't know anybody. I just moved up there and um, she became one of my, one of my best friends and uh, was a bridesmaid in my wedding. So now that um, is a story. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it just took some perseverance. And, yeah. you know, again, I think a lot of people after him, you know, speaking to me the way he did would have just left and never come back um, mm -hmm. because he was very rude. Um, but, you know, we developed a really, really tight relationship and I'm still friends with him to this day um, and his family. So um, it's just you know, that kind of getting knocked down and how many times, it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down, it's how many yeah. times you get back up yeah. kind of mentality. Wow, Rachel, that is a beautiful story. Um, yeah. So you went, you went every day for two months with, with nothing to do with him outside of observe his cases. Yes. And, and of course, he, they allowed you to do that. Well, I mean, yeah, at that time, I mean, again, the hospitals weren't as, they weren't as strict as far as is allowing access to reps and, and the nurses, honestly, they were very happy to have me there because I helped them, you know, make sure they recorded the implants correctly. And, and he had a reputation for not being very nice to a lot of people. <laughs> so a lot of the staff was very nervous around him as well. So I'd get there early, make sure they had all the equipment set up. Um, he had no, I don't know if he knew I was doing that or not. Um, you know, but I'd kind of work with the tech before he got in the room, make sure that they were, they were good to go so that there were no, hiccups in his case right so he may uh -huh. i mean it could have been maybe his cases started going better um once i started doing that i, I really i couldn't tell you i don't know um, well, you, well you're, you're still friends with him today does he ever say you know i might have been a little bit too strict back in those times or, or does he ever speak to it no we don't <laughs> no, sh no shamelessly about it got it got it got it no. okay well that, that's 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 very cool um all right so then you know, you were in your role, you, you, were, you had that role for eight years, correct? Yes. And the industry must have changed a lot within that eight years. Uh, what were some of the biggest changes you experienced that, we, that, that reps experience today? I would say access to, to the OR and to surgeons. Um, you know, hospitals have really tightened down on, you know, allowing reps to come into the room. Um, so it, it, it really is a challenge to earn your place to come into the OR these days. Um, you know, when, when I started, there was no vendor made or rep tracks and things like that. So that kind of started probably around 2011 mm -hmm. is where we really, maybe 2010 is where we really started, um, you know, seeing, well, do you have an appointment? What surgeon are you coming to see? Why are you here today? Um, and you had to have a case to get into the OR. So where that, you know, that just came, became really important to, to build those relationships with, you know, with everybody in the hospital. So, you know, you want to get to that point where, you know, the charge nurse requests for you to be there because, you know, you make her life easier, um, where the surgeon requests you to be there because you make his or her life easier, um, you know, and, and, and building those relationships. So I would say that's where it's changed the most. Um, not that relationships weren't important before because they most certainly are, but 
Um, now it's even more so important. So it's, you know, what, like I say to, to all my team is, you know, just be careful the way you, you talk to anybody um, because you don't know, you know, what position they're going to end up in or how that's going to affect you in, in the future. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have a guy on my team who <laughs> um, he, he had a, a nurse get upset with him three years ago who, you know, got upset with him for something that happened. And then she became a, a charge nurse and won't allow him into the OR. She wow. has him blackballed from that, that entire facility wow. because of something that happened when he worked for a different company at the time. Wow. So, um, and I've had multiple conversations with her about it, about like, what can we do to try to, you know, alleviate this? And, um, you know, she won't budge on it. And, and so, that's you know, important. it's just really important to, to make sure that, you know, you're always on your best behavior when you step foot into that hospital. Always. Yeah, no, I mean, you know what, that's, that's a great thing to highlight. Um, in fact, I want to ask you, you know, being, being a rep, think back to when you were a representative. What are the qualities that a representative needs to have so they can be the rep that, that everyone's excited to have come back? Say reliability is, is number one. You know, when, when you say you're going to do something, get it done and, and with no delay. So if a surgeon calls you and you tell them you'll have a set there ready to go by, you know, seven o'clock tomorrow, if that means getting up and, and driving it at one in the morning, you get up and drive it at one in the morning. Um, you know, it, it's that being available to the surgeon, always answer your phone or return a call within minutes. Um, that, that just means the world. Um, you know, I have one of the sayings that we say is your greatest ability is your accessibility. Um, just always being available because if a surgeon calls you and it takes you an hour or two hours to call him back about a case, chances are he's found somebody else, um, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to service him for that case. So, and again, this is speaking from a trauma standpoint, um, you know, but CMF is the same thing. I mean, there's urgent cases. Um, I was having a conversation with one of our surgeons yesterday. He was telling me how he called how, called his rep at, at midnight on Sunday to come do a rib case that, you know, the patient was was crashing. They weren't planning on doing it. And um, he's like, I don't think I've ever done that to him before in the 10 years that he's been working with wow. me. But I, I put him to the test on Sunday and he showed up. So he was telling me all about it. Um, but it, it really means a lot to, you know, be there when you say you're going to be there. Be, be available and answer your phone. Um, Got it. So reliability is a major one, probably the most major. What are two more? Um, integrity. You know, um, again, if you don't know something, tell them you don't know it. You don't make something up and say, you know, make up some answer if you are not 100% sure of it. So I would say your integrity is, um, it kind of goes in the re reliability, but again, you know, people will respect you a lot more if you just tell them that you don't know rather than, you know, making up a story. Mm -hmm. um, and number three, I would say is just have a, you know, having a great attitude. Um, you know, it's a tough industry. Um, you know, these surgeons are being, they're being bombarded by, by reps on a daily basis. And it's not always, you know, a surgeon who, who's putting in implants, he's also getting called on by pharma reps. He's also getting called on by, you know, pain, pain reps and, and things like that. And people are, are constantly trying to, to get in front of them. So, you know, they're not always going to be receptive to, to speaking with you. Um, and I think your attitude and, and how you react to that um, says a lot about you as a person and also your ability to, to be successful in this field. Got it. Got it. So almost just always being, I guess, a source of positivity and for lack of a better word, joy in in the in in the area i mean yes you know it's it's i always say also about reps like we are not required to be in that room like we are the only people in that room that are not necessary it's a privilege it's not a right um to be there so treat it as a privilege mm -hmm. and remember that you're a guest it, it's like you're you're being invited into someone's home um and and how would you behave and how would you want someone to behave if that surgeon was operating on your mother or your father sure um, you know. Got it. Okay. So now the big question. So you transitioned into leadership. Uh, you had a very great year in 2018. And, and, and was that the move that propelled you forward into a leadership opportunity? Yes, it was. So um, I had taken a position um, 
within our company that was kind of a hybrid rep management type role. Um, I, I took it in 2017 mm -hmm. and um, essentially we were responsible for teaming up with the regional manager and driving growth within our region um, on just very specific products that were not, we were, we're not performing well in our portfolio. Um, so I um, took that opportunity and drove um, the number one region for, we were the number one region for growth in the country for 2018 um, and exceeded our target by like 50%. Um, and, and with that, it was honestly, it was just a matter of, um, you know, getting a solid understanding of the product and showing the value to everybody, the reps that I was working alongside to, to help them be successful selling it. So. Excellent. Excellent. And stepping into that role, what was your first hiring experience like? So um, <laughs> the first one I had was very challenging. Um, it was actually in, a, in an area where there just is not a lot of um, not a lot of higher education. So, you know, one of our requirements is to have a, a bachelor's degree or eight years of experience in, in the medical arena. So um, that was a really, it was a challenging experience. Um, you know, I went through three offers before one of them stuck um, due to, um, you know, people not ha having a clean driving record or having a non-compete at the hospital that they work for currently and not disclosing that. Um, so, you know, that was, it was challenging. Um, I would say now, you know, being in this role a little bit longer and, and um, you know, having associate roles available, it's, you know, for, for me, I'm looking for, for young, hungry people that are not necessarily young, but when I say young, I mean more young to the medical sales sure. arena, um, but sure. looking to, to get in and seeing the bigger opportunity ahead of them, um, yeah. you know, being willing yeah. to, to, you know, to work for their, for, for their position on the team. Got it. Got it. So then I'm going to ask you the top three again, when you're looking for candidates and, and actually I'm going to ask you specifically for candidates that don't have experience and, and you can, you know, include those that don't have experience in sales outside of medical sales and those that don't have experience um, in just specifically medical sales, but might have some sales experience. What do you look for? What are the top three things you look for in candidates like that? Or do you even allow candidates like that? No, I do. Um, so I would say the top three things that I look for um, is if they don't have medical sales experience or, um, you know, or sales experience at all. Like I do get a lot of, of people coming, you know, a couple years out of college. Um, in, in that age range, I typically look for what did you do? What did you do during college? Were you, were you serious about what were you doing? Were you, were you dedicated to trying to get into a career? Um, did you, did you play sports? Were you part of a sorority or fraternity? Were you, you know, did you have a job on the side, um, whatever that job may be? So that's one of the first things I look at just because I want to know if this person's motivated and um, how committed they are to being successful and, um, you know, are they willing to put the work in? Um, I would say the second thing that I look for is, and this gets to the, I would say more, speaks more to, you know, after we've getting, gotten into an interview, but are they competitive? Competitive. Um, you know, this is a competitive industry, and are they are they willing to do what it's what it takes to beat the competition? Which you know it means showing up every day. And so it's looking for someone that has that attitude. That you know is are they willing to to work as hard as possible to to take it to the next level? Um, and I would say the third thing is honestly is um, do they follow up with me? I have been absolutely shocked at the number of candidates that I interview that do not email me back or follow up with me following an interview. Um, you know, the number one thing in sales is follow up and follow up and follow up again. And if you don't follow up with me um, because you're selling yourself to me when you're interviewing, you're dead in the water. I'm not going to chase you for a job. So if you want to get a spot, like you need to show me that you're, that you're interested and that you're driven. And um, so writing a follow-up email is so important. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So then, you know, you mentioned something about, about age and I actually want to talk a little bit about that. You said you have, you have quite a few candidates that come a couple years out of college. What about the candidate that's maybe between 30 years old and 35 and they, they've been working and for whatever reason, they've now decided they want to get into medical device sales. What are the things that come to mind that you need to understand before even considering a candidate like that? 
Well, first thing I would, I would want to know is why, like, why are you making a career change at this point in your life? So having a good story to tell around that is important as to what is your why, what is your motivation behind doing this? Um, and the other thing I would be looking for is, were you successful in what you were doing prior to this? So, you know, did you, did you operate on a high level of achievement and whatever it was that you're doing, it doesn't have to be in sales, but were you, you know, are you, progressing in your current position and maybe you just don't like it and you want a career change into a different industry that that's great and that's fine but were you successful in what you were doing and just not enjoying it Mm -hmm. um so those would be kind of the biggest things that i look at at someone at that age range well that was great rachel you've given us so much insight into the amazing things you've done within your career what it means to be an actual effective medical device sales rep um, especially in cmf can you or do you have anything you'd like to just share with our audience, our listeners about, about getting into the industry and being, and being a a success when you get into the industry? So I would say my biggest piece of advice um, is, you know, just be willing to to take a look at the entire opportunity. So, you know, if you're trying to break in, you don't, don't go in expecting that you're going to, you know, be paid a hundred, you know, six figure type of job you know, as an associate. Um, so just, just walk into the position or the interview understanding that, you know, an associate role is designed to, to help you get your foot in the door and to, to learn, the, learn the industry. And so take that as the opportunity that it is, which is it's a learning position and, it, and it's there for you to learn. And, um, you know, my best advice from there is to just, you know, take the ball and run with it and, and you know, put your nose to the grindstone and, and you'll get to where you want to be. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rachel, for the time you gave us today. And I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Great. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember, I have a couple programs that show you exactly how to break into the medical sales industry, become a top performing medical sales professional, and also how to masterfully navigate your career to executive level leadership. Check out these programs and learn more at EvolveYourSuccess.com. Stay tuned for more awesome content with amazing interviews.